What a day that was. I had Ric Flair in the morning in downtown Tampa. I did the interview with Hulk Hogan on Clearwater Beach that afternoon, came back to the hotel, grabbed a drink with Ric Flair because he invited me to during our interview. Like what? what? You had to. You How had fast to take did that you drink. say yes? What How life fast is this? did you say yes to that? Like that has to oh. be the fastest yes of all time. Ric Flair asked you for a drink. I think that's I the thought he was yes of all time. Did he buy you I, the drink? Did he buy you the drink? Yes. Here comes trouble. It's me, it's me, it's that end to the T2G rolling once again with that BTW Big Trouble of a Bishop taking up the whole screen, and you got myself Nikki the Good, and we are the Meat Pop Express, and boy, do we have a show for you today. They say never meet your heroes, but for the Meat Pops, ah, not for us, because we got our hero right here, right now, in the flesh. He's jacked. He's handsome. He's got a jawline that is carved out of Mount Vesuvius. He's flexing right now. We got Chris Van Fleet on the show. Chris, how you doing, man? I can't even believe I'm here. Oh. Dreams do come true, ladies and gentlemen, and I am living proof right now. You heard it here first. There's dream to come aboard the Meat Pop Express, and we're so excited. No, he's flexing on us a little bit. He's got that. Look at that. You see that plaque in the background? That's what we're going to get someday. Oh, what? I, I didn't even. Oh, oh, like, oh oops. Who put that there? Wait, wait, there's another oh, one? So, oh, my oh, God. Oh, 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 I didn't see the second. Okay, so now we wait, have. Wait, is, that, to... is that an out-of-time license plate from the 1985 <laughs> classic <laughs> Back to the Future signed by oh, Doc yeah. Brown himself, either. Christopher Lloyd, yeah. and Michael J. Be. Fox. Wow. Ben oh, has one of our I, shirts I in the back. We have one. I mean, one. That's yeah, a so one. If you guys want right, so to start buying these shirts, please buy these shirts. But <laughs> that's, um, great that's shirt, awesome. By the way. That's a they're very, they're very nice shirt. Maybe we'll send you one. I mean, if this inter- Look if at what Nikki the Good well. has behind him. I mean, like every I know. piece of merchandise ever. Oh, to my childhood, man. I got the Hasbro collection. I got the Power Rangers. I got Rad. I got I got Rip em no over here. No Holds Barred, Monster Squad. You name it, I've got it, man. But we're just we're just big dorks. Listen, just we're here dorks. because we are here because Chris liked one of our tweets once. <clears throat> from that day on, we just felt there was just an intrinsic connection that we needed to have him on the show. Um, Chris, by the way, congratulations on all your success in all seriousness. You're just rattling off these names week after week. Um, and listen, we appreciate what you're doing for the wrestling community because getting these interviews is big for us. Like, do you feel that you owe it to people now? Like, hey, people are waiting for me to give them the goods. Like, do you feel that anymore? Do you feel that responsibility? Like you're Batman right now? I'm bat. I, I don't know. I think I'd rather be Bruce Wayne. Okay. I feel like I could be Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne, I think is a lot cooler than Batman. Isn't he? Don't hot you think? take. That's a hot diet. That's a hot take. Mm, uh, yeah. But, oh, that uh, that might hot, get me canceled. Right? I, uh, that, possibly. In <laughs> that's some, a clip. Yeah. And some, uh, some subreddit, <laughs> some subreddits really might can't see it for that. I feel I do I do feel like like you know when everyone talks about and I'm going off on a huge tangent here but you know when everyone talks about like who's the best Batman I, mm-hmm. I'm like Christian Bale great Batman but way better Bruce Wayne yeah, yeah okay and Affleck great and maybe the best Batman maybe like the truest version of Batman not a very good Bruce Wayne no. at all no pretty, where do you put where do you put Clooney in that where do you put Clooney in that conversation Clo- I mean Clooney anywhere is clearly the most handsome right but his Batman yeah, with true. the nipples. Ugh. Yeah, that was a bad suit. I mean, I'm I'm a big Kilmer guy, so I, I, I'll always I'll always go for Val Kilmer as my my Batman. Yeah, yeah that's so. that's and that's a controversial take. Michael Keaton though might be the best of both worlds. I'm Batman. Hey, you think? What's your I'm best Batman? Batman? What's your best Batman impression? It's uh, it's a line from The Dark Knight. Okay, okay. Made, like early in the movie when they're uh, the other everyone's dressed up as him. And they're trying to be like Batman himself. And they're like, what's the difference between me and you? And he goes, I'm not wearing hockey pads. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I'm not, wearing, was, hockey I'm not pads. wearing hockey pads. Not wearing if hockey. you didn't yeah. subtitle that. That was great. Hockey. Yeah. Look at us. Five minutes in. We're already talking about Batman. We haven't even we watched wrestling, takes. man. Um, so this is the first question. I, I've been thinking about this question for a long time. So, you know. All these Netflix documentaries coming out, we have the quarterback, like Patrick Mahomes, you know, Kirk Cousins, all these guys, and they're very meticulous in what they go into, like their craft, right? And the preparation. Well, listen, The Rock doesn't do many interviews, right? And you have interviewed The Rock. I can't imagine what it is just to be in the same room as that guy. But can you walk us through? I just need to know what was the morning like? Like, what did you do knowing like when I wake up tomorrow? I'm going to be interviewing arguably like the most famous person on, on the planet. Like, what did that look like? 
So he was at the very top of the list of people that I wanted to interview. He was the number one person. And I had interviewed a lot of other huge stars, but never had got The Rock. And I knew it might be possible because he did a lot of interviews promoting the films that he was doing. And this was taking, we're taking this back to 2012. And WWE was going to be in Cleveland. I was living in Cleveland at the time. And I was working as an entertainment reporter for the CBS station there. And a contact from WWE said, on Monday at Raw, we're going to set you up with an interview. And I'm like, great, amazing, can't wait. And they're like, we'll let you know who it is once we figure it out. But like, get ready. Like, we'll see you at the arena at five o'clock or whatever it was. And then the day before, I remember getting a phone call and they were like, okay, are you ready? I'm like, yeah, yeah I'm ready. I, absolutely. I will see you tomorrow. Like, no, no, no. Are you ready for who the interview's with? And I'm like, I, I think so. Who is it? And they're like, well, you're going to be interviewing. And there's this long pause. I'm like, okay, who is it? The Rock. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no way. <laughs> so not only am I getting an interview with The Rock, but I'm getting The Rock in the setting that I became a fan of The Rock for. Of course, you know, I'm a huge wrestling fan, yeah, but The yeah. Rock was my guy in the Attitude Era. I would walk down the halls of my high school and I would ask people questions just so I could shout, it doesn't matter what you think at them. Like that's how much The Rock meant to me. So- the whole time I'm like, well, now I've got to figure out some questions. I've got to prepare some things. And I so desperately wanted to create a moment with The Rock. And you can watch that interview back. I tried to get him to do a stare down with him, with me. And he just, I don't feel like wasn't like feeling it. But <laughs> the the moment that he walks into the room, you feel his presence. Right. And it's amazing because he's arguably the biggest star on the planet. But he introduced himself and shook the hand of every single person that was in that room. Hey, good to meet you. I'm Dwayne. Hey, nice to meet you. I'm Dwayne. And he just set the tone. And then he stayed afterwards. We all took photos with him. He autographed a magazine that is hanging on my wall now. He's the best. You, they always say you shouldn't meet your heroes. But if your hero is Dwayne Johnson, you should do whatever you can to meet your hero because he goes out of his way to make it like a special moment for you. I also did this weird thing in our very first interview where I was like trying to pop my pecs with him, which you can't see now, you know, I'm sure. Yeah, there it is. Oh yeah. Can't yeah. probably can't see it with the black t-shirt, but I was like, Hey, could, could you give me a little bit? He's like, ah, I'm good. Now you can do it though. And I, it's like, <laughs> oh, come on, come on, give me a moment. Right. Yeah. But I was, mean, how many, so how many questions did you write out? And then did you like have to narrow it down? Like, is that part of your process? Like, did you yeah. write, uh, what was it a hundred? Like, what are we talking here? I think what? that interview was like seven minutes. So I was like, I think I've written down out of 10 or 12 and it was kind of like ranking them. Like, okay, if I only, they cut this down, if it's only three minutes, which of the questions we for sure need to include. Mm -hmm. but yeah. I was throwing stuff all together and like on a piece of paper. And I do this all the time. Now <clears throat> I'll have lists going on my iPhone of like, if, and when I ever interview so-and-so I've already got like these concepts, these ideas, and then we'll, you know, we'll expand them out into real questions from there. But I'm always thinking about that. And it's not just like having a great conversation with someone, which is something I, I try to really pride myself on, but it's also like, what moments can we create? What's the 30, 40, 50 second moment from this that could end up living on its own as a clip? So you're saying like visualization is big because it sounds like you probably just went over in your head over and over again. Like I'm going to interview the rock one day. And when that day comes, like, these are the things that I'm going to want to pull out of it. Like, is that part of like the process? Cause you, uh, obviously you're extremely successful. Right. And people are probably looking at you like, how do I become like CVV? How does it happen? Like is visualization, visualization part of that process? First of all, I would say set the bar a lot higher. Okay. than this set the bar a lot higher. But no, I think I don't think it's visualization. I think it's just like, I've been really fortunate to be able to do this for a long time right now. And I think that one interview with one person kind of leads to another one, which leads to another one. You're kind of building on this. So it's like, yeah, one day I'm going to get, you know, an interview with like, I'm, I know I'm going to interview John Cena at some point again. I've interviewed him already four times. I know it's going to happen at some point again. I'm really crossing my fingers that it's for an hour this next time rather yeah. than just like five or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I think was the last one. So for me, it's just like, it's going to happen one day. I don't know if it's this week or next week or next year, but at some point it's going to happen. So I'm just going to jot down some ideas here. 
Mm-hmm. And probably when you're interviewing it, like guys like The Rock said, it was like seven minutes. So I'm sure it was for something. It was for like a mar- it was he was marketing a movie or marketing. He's a At marketing time, mach- guy's they, a marketing machine. The big thing they wanted to push there was the WrestleMania 28 match with Cena. And okay. then okay. this this shows you how long ago it was. His publicist goes, Oh, he's also in G.I. Joe 2, if you want to promote that. I'm like, <laughs> wow. What was How that, funny the, is re- that? Like Rebellion or something? G.I. Joe yeah. 2 and Fast and Furious oh, yeah. was really what made The Rock the rock that mm-hmm. we know now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about being in high school and hitting people with a one-liner. Um, ben, do we have a certain like guy we want to get into? Like, was there someone that you know? Of course, like, of course. Know, we is there do. any gimmicks that we wanted to is talk there... about? And I think I think I I think I'm picking up what you're putting down here, Nick. And I I wanted to go. You know, you you prepared for the Rock, and that that's you know you went through WWE, you went through it, but you also walked through the doors of the Beach Shop as well, the most prolific Beach Shop in the country, Hogan's Beach Shop. Now, how did that day go? That's oh. what we really want to know because we are the biggest pro Hogan podcast going. So we got to know what, how was that? We need to know how Hogan was. So first of all, if you're a huge Hogan fan, you can go to Hogan's hangout, his bar on Clearwater beach, any Monday for karaoke. I heard he's about that. There. I'm a big karaoke guy too. So that's two birds so, with one stone. I mean, so then Ben, this is, this is your dream then. It's karaoke uh, with Hulk I'm Hogan watching down. you. I'm driving down. Not even. Let me anymore. tell I'm you something. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, was I he have... in full gimmick? Was he in full gimmick like for the interview? Was he just like, does he just walk in his gimmick? No, not at all. No, really? Actually. And so that was actually part of the, like one of the questions that I asked him during the interview. So he walks in and he he says, "Hello, I'm Terry." So like, like <laughs> that, that shows you how humble he is. Yeah, I had had the great fortune of interviewing him three times before. So that was our fourth okay. interview, certainly our longest interview mm-hmm. and most in-depth interview for sure. And maybe one of the most in-depth interviews he's done in recent years, but yeah, he's, he was Terry. And before we started rolling, he was asking me about like my kid. And he's like, look, brother, I'm seeing you everywhere. You're popping up on social media everywhere. I'm like, I'm everywhere. You're <laughs> you- everywhere. You know who you are? Like he's, he is so humble. And I feel wow. like he, He's really aware of who Hulk Hogan is and who Terry Bollea is. And I feel like he can turn it on in a second and be that guy. But I really think that I talked to Terry for most of that interview. But okay. what a day that was. I had Ric Flair in the morning in downtown Tampa. <laughs> I did the interview with Hulk Hogan on Clearwater Beach that afternoon, came back to the hotel, grabbed a drink with Ric Flair because he invited me to during our interview. Like what... What? You had to. You How had fast to take did that you drink. say yes? What How life fast is that? Did you say yes to that? Like that has to oh. be the fastest yes of all time. Rick Flair asked you for a drink. I think that's I the thought he was yes of all time. Did he buy you I... the drink? Did he buy you the drink? Yes. So did. that's 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 a thing. So quick quick anecdote here. I, Chris, I was trained by James Ellsworth. So he told me one time. He said, I went to the bar. It was after a show or something, and Rick Flair and Scott Hall were there. And, you know, he was like, you know, Ric Flair is one of my heroes. I wanted to buy him a drink. And Scott said, no, 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 you do not buy him a drink. He buys you a drink. It's like you let him buy you a drink. You do not say I'll pay for it. You do not. You let him buy you a drink. So, yeah, so if I ever come across Ric Flair, I'm going to let him buy me a drink. But, <laughs> I, and I will say this. I don't know if Rick wants this out there, but he paid for everything. Like, yeah, I guess that's kind of uh, guy. <laughs> we, we He ended up leaving uh, and going back up to his uh, apartment. We, I stayed, I was with Mike Kyoto. We stayed and had like some food and then I went to pay the bill and they were like, there's, there's no bill. It's, it's been taken <laughs> care of. I'm like, no, no, I, I, I just, but I ordered the steak. They're like, yeah, yes, it's, it's been Get taken it. care of, sir. He's, he lives it. Like, he lives his gimmick. <sighs> um, speaking of limit, uh, living gimmicks. Now you weren't always Chris Van Vliet. You went by a different name, right? Like you had a gimmick back in the day that we mm. saw on the old IG. Right, Ben. Who are we talking about? Who is this stunner? We are. Who we, is are this ta- guy? we are talk. We are talking about the prolific Chris Sharf. That's who we, we got to know more about. about Chris. We got to know the years you were active. We got to <laughs> know your finisher. We got to know the entrance theme. Whole thing. You know you have. I got. I got. I got to know what belts you want because in the picture you have it. You have a belt. In I your did. Hand. Yeah, big Goldie. So we need to know what feds. It. What feds you worked for? We got to know the payoff. No, we don't know the payoffs. Uh, but we got to know. <laughs> I worked for the Fed that me and my buddies created, the <laughs> HCW. The this H- backyard C- wrestling was huge. HCW. So what does HCW stand for? They Hard- wanted it to be hardcore Canadian wrestling. And I said, guys, 
we can't just limit ourselves to Canada. This is an international thing. Like Biodome. This is hardcore we're not, we're, championship we're not, wrestling. We're not talking locally. We're talking globally, brother. So were That's you a right. hardcore wrestler? Were you like a deathmatch guy? I, definitely not. I mean, come okay. on. I, mean, I, I, I don't see any of the scars. So no. I, 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 so, I, so tell I us about Chris Shaw. What's the gimmick? We need to know. Chris Sharp guy? was like a combination of, I was a big Triple H fan as well. Okay. So I'd say that Chris Sharp had the heel mannerisms of Triple H. I even taped just my left wrist and then mm -hmm. taped my right wrist and my right hand, very Triple H-ish. Mm -hmm. I would cut promos chewing gum, very Triple H-ish. <laughs> yeah. So you were a heel. Uh, yeah, I was a big time heel. You were a heel. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, I wasn't I a big guy, right? I was like 160 pounds or something in high school. So my move set was, it was just terrible. Okay. Like I realized there's zero psychology in backyard wrestling. <laughs> my move set was like, uh, I did a twist of fate. I would set up my finisher with just incredibles. That's incredible. Which is the twisting okay. tombstone. All mm -hmm. right. Yep. And then my finisher was the swanton bomb. Were you wrestling on like, what were you wrestling? Did you build a ring? Like, did you have I, one of those makeshift rings? Or did you guys throw mattresses in the backyard? I wish. No, my buddy Greg, who was in our wrestling federation as Rage was his name. He was very like Raven, pretty Rage. much was Raven. <laughs> he had some blue gym mats, like the very thin oh, yeah. gymnastics mats. So we put, I don't know, there's four of them maybe. We put them out in like a little, not even a square. It was like a rectangle. But now we needed things to jump off of. So we had the tables that most wrestling federations would use to put people through. We were jumping off of them to do our high risk moves. So <laughs> it, it, I look back at it now and guys, I'm like, I, I can't believe that someone didn't get like seriously hurt. Yeah. We did have one guy, my buddy, Will, he went by Danny courageous. Danny courageous. There was a spot where we were wrestling in a park and he's like, let's go fight on the bridge. And there's like this bridge above this tiny little Creek. I'm like, all right. So I'm throwing punches on this bridge. He goes, throw me off. And I'm like, all right, so grab his head and take him to the corner. He does a full front flip over. And as he lands, we hear crack. Oh, his leg, his leg broke. Oh, in the match it's always the hardest thing to, yeah, hardest thing to explain. You had to throw up the axe, I imagine. You throw up the axe. The, you know? It just ended. He was like, ah, and I went to jump on him and he rolled out of the way. And I'm like, this is weird. Like, what's going on here? And he's like, ah, stop. Ah. And then we <laughs> very quickly got out of there. Being that, that's the then thing about like being a big time wrestling fan. And I have a son now. Like, uh, I just had, I have two, but he's nine months now. And I'm just thinking, like, he's going to be doing this stuff. And back then when I was doing it, like there was no social media. So there wasn't as much of like a pressure, like, oh, I want to get this monster spot. Like, mm. you know, like just the anxiety that I'm going to have of being like, is this kid backyard wrestling right now? Like, what is he doing? If like, social doing? media existed when I was in high school and backyard wrestling was as big as it was at that time. I don't know if I'd be sitting here right now. I just, I feel like I would have just been trying to like outdo right. myself and like keep doing these stupid, stupid things. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you never, so you never, that. you never officially trained. I, so I did. I oh, did. You did. When I was, when I was 20, I went to the squared circle, a wrestling school in Toronto. Okay. And I trained for a few months. It was in between my sophomore and junior year of college. I so badly wanted to be a pro wrestler yeah. so badly. And I went and I trained and then it was during the summer and then it was time to go back to school. And I had a, like a big decision to make. Do I focus on wrestling school or do I focus on school school? Because I'm a big believer in the phrase, the man who chases two rabbits catches none. And I knew I couldn't put all of myself into both wrestling school and all of myself into getting my communication studies degree. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I've got to figure this out. So I'm like, I will get my degree and then wrestling will always be there. And now I feel really fortunate. Like I get to put my degree to use in mm -hmm. broadcasting and whatever it's turned into now with streaming and podcasting. And every once in a while, I dip my toe into the wrestling world as a ring announcer or as, you know, doing a lot of interviews, backstage interviews, stuff like that. So it's like, it's kind of the best of both worlds. And yeah. I just turned 40 right. and all my wrestling friends who are 40 and I'm not trying to like pat myself on the back here, but <laughs> all my wrestling friends who are 40 and they get out of bed in the morning, things they're, hurt a little bit. They're hurting. They're hurting. No, yeah, we, hurt. Same for you, big Ben. I'm, I'm feel, oh, I feel, I feel, I mean, you know what, to be honest though, you know, I played college basketball, so I actually hurt more doing that. People ask me all the time. I'm like that, that running up and down on the plot on the wood all all day. That that shit hurt. 
That shit really hard. So I, I don't take as many bumps either. I'm a big guy, right? I'm That's take, true. I You're I might take bumps. as much. Exactly. But the fact exactly. that I can wake up and my neck doesn't hurt, my knees don't yeah. hurt, my back doesn't hurt. I'm like, I feel like I'm a big <laughs> believer that everything in life happens for a reason. And I feel like I was put on this path that I'm on now for a reason. And maybe it's because, you know, no. I won't can, be sore in the morning. I don't know. Can you point to one interview where it just clicked where you were like, mm. I got it. Like where like you saw a seismic shift in your like actual career. Was there one where like or moment whether, or whatever? Yeah, whether it was like you were like, okay, like I know my voice, I know who I am, like I got this. Like, or was there just a general moment where you like, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life? Like, was there ever that moment for you in any particular like interview or anything you've ever done? I remember when I got hired for MTV2 Canada. So I was hosting a show in Vancouver called 969. And we got to interview a lot of musicians and some actors. And I remember like the interviews just never flowed that well. Like they would be good if we would post, you know, two or three questions, put it together, make a three minute segment for TV. And I remember some of my friends would post their long, like 15, 20 minute raw interviews. And I'd be like, I would be so embarrassed to put my raw interview online because it just was, I don't know. It just didn't make sense. Like it didn't, it wasn't cohesive. And I remember just trying to work on that, like trying to make it so that the conversation flowed a little bit better. And I remember there was one real moment in my career when I feel like things stepped up a lot. And it was, I got hired in Cleveland. This is 2000, yeah, the year 2000. And I went to cover the Oscars and I stepped foot on the Oscars red carpet for the very first time. And I was just like, okay, like, this is the biggest night in entertainment and I'm here right? and I'm getting paid to be here. And that was a really big moment. And I think in terms of interviews, there was one that I think, you know, people watching might even be familiar with this. The interview that I did with Chris Jericho in the backseat of his car, right after he signed with AEW, got me on a lot of people's radar. My YouTube channel started in 2011, by the way, and it took me seven and a half years to get a silver play button. Like it is a slog. It is a very mm -hmm. slow journey. And that interview, eight years after I started my YouTube channel with Chris Jericho, and it's basically him talking about his decision to leave WWE, why he signed with AEW, what he expects from it and everything else that went along with that. That interview got me in front of a lot of wrestling fans and made people you know, learn who I was. And that's one I think I would really credit this whole journey to. And a big thank you to Chris Jericho for finding the time to do that with me. I was going to say, like, did you feel like because it was Jericho and he is who he is, like it opened up opportunities with other wrestlers as well. Like they see you with Jericho. Jericho clearly had a good time with you, right? The, the interview was great. And do you feel like be, him, him being who he was added to that as well? That was my third interview with Jericho. And the reason that this one happened when it happened is because we had a mutual friend that was basically like, oh, like if you guys are ever in right. the same place at the same time, this should happen. And then the timing just worked out really well that he had just signed with AEW. But yes, especially in 2019, when AEW was just starting out, that interview with Jericho led to me doing interviews with Cody before Double or Nothing with the Young Bucks. And then... Jericho put in a good word with Tony Khan. And I was wow. one of the very first interviews that Tony Khan yeah. did. Like Tony Khan did talk as Jericho and then he did my show. And then like, then he was doing like all the press conferences after the shows, but he wasn't doing a lot of interviews at that time. And it was because Jericho, I think I, I like tweeted out like, Hey, Tony Khan, I saw you were just on talk as Jericho. I'd love to have you on my show. Jericho retweeted. And I was like, Oh, wow. This actually might be a thing. Yeah. So when I messaged Jericho and I said, I thank you so much for retweeting that. Do you actually think that we can make this happen? He goes, I don't know. Let me text him. And then he like gets back to me. He's like, yep, he'll do it. And I'm like, wow. I've oh. been in the, I've been in the room a few times with Tony, obviously over at Barstool. He's a funny guy. Like he'll come in and be like, I have 15 minutes. Hour and a half later, yes. he's, he's going down a card that happened in 1984 and breaking down why it changed the biz, brother. <laughs> That's just Tony, like Tony and like, uh, 
Yeah, no, I, I love I love hearing how that happened because it's just like that's why like you know Ben and I like maybe it's not the Oscars but like you know when we when Ben when we were on that star cast stage Ooh, man, the, the red carpet it that's started. that's what we felt when we were in the halls pretty much the, the same thing pretty, pretty much the same thing those, yeah. those disgusting carpets at the uh, yeah, the just, Regency whatever yeah, what just was, Hyatt Regency <laughs> downstairs in the collector's room or whatever like that you know saddled up next to Rikishi and Axe and Smash. Yeah, that's what we it's, it's the same as being next, you know, Frank Darabont and M. Night Shyamalan, you know, similar yeah. to that, right? Yeah, they, the Oscars. I mean, they, yeah. both places smell the exact same. Too, uh, do they? Like do they? The yeah. Oscars smell that smell like that? Yeah, too. That's what the Oscars smell like. Interesting. That was a who's who. I'm looking at it right now. Uh, best actor, Russell Crowe, Sean Penn, Denzel Washington. I they I, well, Kevin Spacey won that year. Uh, Michael Caine was there too. Tom Cruise. Michael wow, Caine. Can you guys Michael do a Michael Caine? I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it. And Michael K and Michael Caine saying yes to anything. They burn oh, the forest. It. They burn now the forest down. Now he's, burn. I love now he's done. Things. Now he's you done. All say, respect to him. 90 years old, finally retired. You don't say Michael Caine. You say my oh, cocaine. Michael my cocaine. My cocaine. My cocaine. I actually never heard that before. Um, <laughs> uh, I got we. So yeah, the other the other day we did a little uh, spooky gimmick tiering list. Right. Mm. And we thought it'd be fun to hear from you regarding occupational gimmicks. So mm. we're big into jobs here, like just in general, like, and we want to know what do you, what do you consider the best occupational gimmick from back in the day? Oh my gosh. It might be the repo man. Oh, because, wow. I mean, now, was he a heel or a face though? We've, that we, is, a, we'll never know. Right. Like people aren't paying their bills. Yeah. You know, like maybe they're the heel and he's just the baby face being that's like, good, listen, that's a really good point. If you're behind in your bills and he's just taking what the bank owns, who's the bad guy here? Right. IRS was oh, just you. trying to get tax sheets. Like he was just yeah. like, do we like tax sheets? Is that mm. what we're saying in America? As you, as you get you know? as you get older, you really see who the true heels and faces were. This is true. The big boss man. Is he a bad guy? Is he a corrupt oh, cop? Right, yeah. man. Yeah, was the Mountie true. all that bad? Was the Mountie all that bad? The, I um, mean, I'm from Canada. The Mountie's a, just a pure baby face to me. Was Love he that. was he like number two of like Canadian heroes behind Bret so Hart? Like Bret Hart. <laughs> 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 the Mountie, I thought so, yeah. <laughs> I, I was so. like, I, I, I've never been a big fan of the characters that are like hitting you over the head with what country they're from. I've never been yeah. a big fan of that. Okay, so you weren't like really big into like the, the, uh, the she like the chic, like Iron Chic, or I get it? I get yeah, it. Yeah, you just, get it. It just feels like it's the cheapest of cheap heat, like Nikolai Volkov. Yeah. I okay. get it. I understand it. But like when uh, Team Canada was a thing in TNA yep. or the Un Americans in WWE, Un -American, it's just yeah. like. I get it. You know, you think you're better than this other country because you're from a different country. I get it. It's like Vince just Vince just yeah. thought any any foreigner was a bad guy. It doesn't matter where yes, you're like, from. You're a bad I guy if you're for, a foreigner. <laughs> I felt for La Resistance because I was like, just because you happen to be from France and, you know, the state of the world that was happening at that time, it's like, well, you're instantly going to be bad guys and never going to win. Oh, yeah, those guys, those guys had a tough go. They definitely did. Young guys, too. They started when they were like 19, Rene Dupree. And uh, I mean, you know, if we're still talking about occupational, uh, you know, jobs here, The Undertaker. I mean, well, of, course, course. of course, probably the best one. And I remember one of my very first memories of watching wrestling, it was on at my grandparents' house and my uncle was there and he goes, do you know what an undertaker is? And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's that guy. He goes, yeah, but do you know what he does? <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, he like works at a cemetery, like buries people. I'm like, huh? Right. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember watching that. I, I don't think I've ever been, that probably was the most frightened I've ever been of a character. I'm, I'm born in 85. So we're roughly the same. Like that was very, very real to me. Like I actually thought a dead person like was I, literally walking among us at at the very moment. I had no idea. I thought Paul Bearer was just a name. I didn't know Paul Bearers were the ones that carry caskets and at funerals. Mm -hmm. I thought it was just his name. I was like, why are they calling these guys? It's not a wrestling. Like, no, that's, that's actually the name of the guys carrying the casket. Like, oh here's, oh here's another one for you what wrestler made you the most angry as a kid now you seem like the type of guy it's almost i've like i don't ever i don't even know if you've ever been angry in your life you're just such a nice mm. guy but what wrestler like the, when they won you were like the next day at school was like it was an issue like you were visu visibly upset i feel like i'm gonna have to really think about this one 
I, I think it was, it wasn't just like the wrestler. I, I wasn't upset that that wrestler won, but there's definitely times where like, if someone won that just didn't make sense at the time, I'm like, what is happening here? I remember I, getting really angry that Eugene was in the main event of whatever pay-per-view that was at the time. And, you know, we have all the world's information in front of us here, so we should probably look it up. But I, I loved the Eugene character, but I, when he went into the main event of whatever that was, I'm going to see if I can find it here. I was just like, how, like, how is this a thing? Like, this doesn't make any sense to me. Did he go over and whatever this was? I don't he, did think he, so. No. I, yeah, it's wild too, because Nick Dimsmore was such a great, such a great wrestler. And he kind of had this gimmick that, you know what though? People are going to remember it forever. So at the yeah. end of the day, at the end of the day, I mean, we're yeah, talking I'd, about it right now. We are ex exactly. We had that in our tier list, the Shockmaster tier. Gimmicks yeah. that might not have been great, but you're going to remember it for the rest of time, and That's and true. it will be in it will it'll be in wrestling lore. So yeah, I was, I, mean, a, I was a big Triple H fan, like I said, and I it made me so angry the way that Jr. would talk about him. Yeah, and I, I get it. Triple H was the ultimate heel at that time. But if you watch the clips back where JR is like, I can't believe you, you dirty son of a bitch. Oh my God. <laughs> I remember getting so angry that like Triple H would do something and then a babyface wrestler would do a very similar thing. And JR would be like praising the babyface for doing the exact same dastardly thing. And then Triple H would do it. And he'd be like, you know, getting so mad and scolding him. It's I actually like how Hogan would Hogan would rake people like he would do the eyes. He would rake the eyes and he would basically bite people. And they'd be like, you know, that's just Hogan fighting back. I'm like, right. he's biting somebody, man. I remember writing an email to his WWF at the time. I remember writing an email. I wish I, I I would love to go see if I could still have it. And being like, the way that JR talks, and I was like 17, 16, 17. I was like, the way that JR talks about Triple H is not fair. Like it's right. not fair because he's doing the same things the other wrestlers are doing, but you're giving Triple H just a hard time about this. So th that would be it. This is the closest I've ever got to boiling over and yelling here, guys. So hot, I mean, hot take. You are so mad at Jr. I yeah, got I a point would. there. <laughs> very JR. mad at Jr. I'm a very I'm a big logistics person. Things need yeah. to make sense for me, and that mm -hmm. did not make sense. So um, again, it's just the way you look at it. Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? But he Jr. Obviously, being one of the best made us feel that Triple H was truly, truly a horrible person. But if you look at it through his, I always say it's about Game of Thrones. It's the same thing. If you looked at it through the Lannisters' eyes, that show, it's not. They're not the bad mm -hmm. guys in that show. But yeah. we're looking at it through the other, through uh, the Starks, through, yeah. Yeah, through their eyes. So it's a is written by the victors, right? Exactly. You got that right. Absolutely. That's, that's a uh, logistics is a, is a good segue for this. So we feel that the way we got on your radar is we had a little clip based off the world's most famous segment called that's not going to work for me, brother. Yeah. And these Arguably. are th this segment is based off some of the things that just would not be. They wouldn't work for Hulk Hogan. We're not talking Terry. We know you know Terry. We don't know Terry, but we know the Hulkster, brother. So just give us one thing that you could think about in modern pro wrestling, 2023, that would not work for Hulk Hogan, brother. Like, what can you point to right now where you're like, no, nah, Hogan's not signing up for that. And it can be a mix between you, yourself, and Hogan, too. So yeah. it doesn't work for both of you. Sure. I, I would have to think uh, if I'm Hulk Hogan, uh, letting Roman Reigns pin me is probably not going to work for me, brother. <laughs> no, Hogan's right. going over in three minutes. Hogan's I, that's Hogan. it. I'm booking it. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, eight, I would, eight to ten minutes. I take the heat it. for a bit, and then we got a big blow the big comeback. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that's that's not going to work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What about what about yourself? What doesn't work? Does what does not work for you today in modern wrestling? And I, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be the in ring. It can be the backstage. It can be the online. It can be whatever. And this is going to sound so stupid, but the draft does not work for me, brother. <laughs> oh, don't get me started, dude. It bothers me <laughs> so much that we'll have a big show and these people go to Raw and these people go to SmackDown. And then a week and a half later, someone will show up on Raw and they'll be like, what's that person doing here? Yeah, right. They're not supposed to be on this show. And it's like, Oh my God, that would be the equivalent to like playing for the Oakland Athletics and then one day just randomly showing up on the Blue Jays. Like if you're going to have a draft, make the draft mean something. And it bothers me 
to no end that we every single year, these are the raw people, these are the SmackDown people. And about three weeks later, they're all mixed together and it makes no sense. Logistics. Yeah. You just said, literally, you just said like logistics, Bob, it needs to be because I have gone off on the draft more than I ever care to ever again. I am absolutely exhausted by it. I understand why they're doing it. And if they stuck to it, I think it would work, but mm -hmm. they just never stick to it. They it's never stick big, to it. It's a big joke on us at this point. Like they're making me look dumber than I look right now. Like, and that's pretty hard to do. And before Roman had both of the titles, imagine explaining this to somebody who's never watched wrestling before. This person has the blue belt because they only wrestle on Fridays. Right. This person has the red <laughs> belt because they only wrestle on Mondays. Well, who's the champion then? Right. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. Days of the week, man. Don't get me started. I've been trying to unify these belts forever. I've been trying yes. to, I've cut so many clips just in tagging Triple H and nausea and being like, hey man, look at this clip. Look at all my logic that I'm throwing in your face, man. Get rid of these belts. I want yes. one belt and I want the all, all. And if yep. Roman, Roman has to hold it for the next 30 years. I'd rather that than have like the super universal. Why are the, why are the tag team championships four titles? Why are they four belts? <laughs> I'm getting heated, man. It doesn't make, and then when Cody, like, remember when Cody had a big announcement and he was like, I'm bringing Jey Uso over to Raw. I was like, what about the draft? What, right. like, how do you have the power it, to do that all of a sudden? It doesn't, it doesn't even make sense. No, no, nah. it doesn't. And we're, we got, we, we got you going on that one. That, that is, so that's not going to work for me, brothers. No, it doesn't work no. for anyone. It shouldn't we needed work. Hogan. It wouldn't work for Hogan. He needed to be on every show. Yeah. He, need, he needed to be on every show. And considering all right, we're going to, we're going to go with so this. Might, Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Ben. No, I was going to say a lightning round. We want to do the Mount Rushmore of wrestling media. So we want you to get you to give us all time your top four. It can be interviewers backstage. We can throw commentators in there if you want to too. We know Jr. is not going to be on that list of yours, but let's let's give you your top four. Your Mount Rushmore of pro wrestling media of all oh time. And if you want, and you can put yourself if you want. You go right ahead. I don't. I can't right. do that. No, that would be silly. <laughs> you but you're saying I could put like WWE, AEW commentators on there? Anybody. Yeah, commentators. Anybody. Any commentators, backstage correspondents. Do you want to throw in like, in-ring announcers? We're going to count them? Anybody, uh, yeah. Any uh, why not? Okay. No wrestlers. We'll say no, re no wrestlers okay. or wrestling So not media. We're talking about like commentators and announcers, personality. Okay. Yeah, yeah but we could, you could throw media in there if you want to. Too. If you want to throw like, one, one person. It would not make know. sense to have a list where it's like Mean Gene and like Sean Ross Sapp, although I love Sean, but like Ben's trying to get us listed. That's what he's trying to do. He was trying oh, to get okay. us listed. Let's do just this. Go, Let's just do go this. personalities. <laughs> All right, you go. I, we're not going to complicate it. Go ahead. Do you, go. Do you think? Go. Mean Gene. Okay? okay. Mean Gene for sure. I mean, just absolute legend. Howard Finkel, another okay. yep. absolute legend. We're going to throw JR on there because I think that, you know, even non biased, was, you're non biased journalist. Even though he was so mean to Triple H when I was yeah. a Triple H fan. <laughs> when he didn't deserve it. Yep. But, but JR is the voice of our childhood. And uh, I think that you've got to give him his credit because so, so good. Oh, this, this is the hardest thing about Mount Rushmore's, right? Gotta leave somebody out. Four. Gotta yep. leave somebody gotta leave out. Gotta a lot of people out here. Yep. One more. And I think there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be like, man, you put JR on there instead of Michael Cole. You say nice things about Michael Cole all the time. And I do. Michael Cole is. I mean, he's the man. He is. He really so is. So underappreciated. He needs, his, he needs his flowers now. Not, not, not later. How? He is so He could good. have a TikTok account of just his reactions. Like, you know, how you see him, how he stands up. Now people are getting him on video. Yeah. He just, he, he just looks like he's having so much fun. Like it so, looks like it, it, he look it's just like he's rejuvenated over the last few years. And I feel like that people, unfortunately can't appreciate something great as it's happening. Yeah. It's only in hindsight that you mm -hmm. go, Oh, wow, man. That thing was really good. He's he's in wrestling happens all the time. John Cena, you can look at right now. People weren't appreciating when we had him, you know, Michael oh. Cole, a hundred percent. And, but now we're, I think he's starting to get some flat. I think people are starting to realize it, but you got one more. You can okay. put him. You can put him if you want. I think I'm I'm gonna go Mike Tanay. Oh Mike my God! I Mike Tanay. All Mike right. Tanay in TNA, and in fact, I'm gonna was, I'm gonna yes. pair Mike Tanay and Don West together. Okay. Mm -hmm. As one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the way that they called TNA, if you go back and watch mm -hmm. TNA 2005, six, seven, that was the best commentary team that was happening at that time. Oh yeah. They got excited, and you got excited. So good. 
Like yeah. may, may Don West rest in peace. Mm-hmm. An absolute legend. He wasn't even a wrestling guy. That's the crazy thing. Wasn't yeah. even a wrestling guy. He was a like a, a pitch man on TV. And they mm-hmm. saw his energy and went, do you think you could bring this over to wrestling? Oh, yeah, man. So, sometimes it's, you, you never know we're going to find it. You never know we're going to find like it. Guys like Matt McAfee, you know, there's no rest. Like not, he just was a fan, you know, and he can come over and he, like, again, yeah, he, he's one of the reasons Michael Cole's career seems like it's been rejuvenated. It's true. You know, yeah. and then you got and and of course, like Don West, absolutely. It's unfortunate, you know, we never saw Don West in like the WWE where people might have known a little bit more about him. Um, but he was he was great. Really, those old TNA clips were were amazing. I love TNA, like the 08, 09, like all, all those years. Yeah. You would have been champ there. You would have been champ there, Ben. You me, you think so? Through. Yeah, well, I think you tell, tell Tom tell Tommy Dreamer to get to get me yeah, signed. We'll, 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 we'll champ right now. I'm gonna be we'll down who's to champ Tommy. now. Who's he gonna win? Oh, you know, who's he gonna beat? Is he gonna be Kurt Angle? You're gonna be Kurt Angle in the prime time. Oh, we're we talking about that. We talk about then or now. Oh, then now. I, I have a win over Steve Macklin a couple months ago. There we but, go. I say yeah, he was a former champ. He was a former. By the champ. way, honorable mention of the Meat Pop Express, of course. There Thank we you. go. Of course, we Thank are number and, two on the, and, number two. And with that, though, Ben. This is how we wanted to close this out. And Chris, th- thank you again for your time. We really appreciate it. But course, we wanted to pleasure. give you the opportunity because we've never been in the room with like a legit interviewer like this. You need can you, uh, just ask us one question. You as the interview asked the Me Pop Express. Wow. Yeah, okay. you get to ask us one question. Wow, this is amazing. Okay, yes. hold on, hold on. Wow. Yep. There it wow. Is. I, I needed to. I needed to do it. I don't have the big sunglasses like you guys. It's fine. But- Amazon, twenty bucks, brother. You're good. That seems like a ripoff. The yeah. fake pit vipers. Mm, fake pits. Yep. Hip vipers. These are. Uh, these are some. I don't even know what these are. Man, what a, what an honor! What a pleasure to be sitting down with you guys. This is absolutely incredible. Uh, tell me, who would win in a match between both of you? All right. Well, now this this now this gets this, this gets tricky. This gets tricky. Yeah. Obviously, I have the size advantage, the experience advantage. Uh, Nick, Nick, though, I mean, Nick's sneaky strong. Nick's uh, Nick's sneaky strong. He could he could pull. Yeah, side. I don't Ooh. know, Ben. I, I could think- I could see. You know, I'm thinking really hard about it. Probably be Nick in like two minutes, but. Yeah, that you would be very a, that, kind here because you are yeah. a you're a, a shoot seven foot one, I think, right, Ben? I'm I'm a sh- well, I'm a shoot six ten, but we say six twelve. We say yeah, six, we say six twelve. I'm anyone. five foot nothing. Um, but listen, I remember, a- I remember walking in. I remember walking into DDP's house. And I saw Chris sitting there. He was like, "Yeah, come introduce me to my friend Chris." And I remember Chris is going, "Oh." My God, you are, like, you you're are a big, big dude. dude. You are huge. <laughs> I, I remember walking through Starcast, and we were just getting interviews left and right because of how big Ben. Was. I was like, "This is so easy. Why doesn't <laughs> everybody do this?" Dude, just how walk- many times a day? And here's another. Yeah, we'll just. I'll be oh, ask another one. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. How many times a day do people ask you how tall you are? How many? It depends. It really depends where I am. But if I'm at like through the airport is insane. The grocery store is insane. Like a lot of people. So anytime I, you're in public is what anytime, you're saying. Anytime I'm in public, I'll at least get it once or twice. Yeah. Hey, anytime. how tall are you? Yeah. It just, and it becomes so dumb. It's like, wow, you're the worst is, wow, you're tall. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, what do I say to that? At least you can say you're a pro wrestler, though. Like you're a wrestler. At least I can say if you're just a regular, really tall person, it's like, what's your story? It's like, oh, then it goes. But then it goes. Oh, you're a wrestler. Oh, WWE. I'm just like, (laughs) do you know? Now I got. Now I got to explain. Now I got to explain what independent wrestling is. And I also get all the time. I'll get. Oh, you look like Big Cass. Oh, you look like 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 Kevin Nash. Oh, I'll get all. I'll get big. I get big Cass all the time. I get big cats. Oh, he's a very them. handsome man. That's quite a, a compliment. A lot of he is. He's a great. He's in great shape. A great guy too. But um, think yeah. about this. You talked about Game of Thrones. If this was like way back in that time, you would like you'd be one of the most important people in the yeah. village. So you know what? Let's take this clip. Let's take. It. I'd be one of the most important people back in that time. It also could be the most important people on wrestling TV right now. So get out the checkbook. Get out the contracts. Tony, Vince, Triple H. Get them out. Both cons, honestly. Get them out because I'm sitting right here. And Chris just said I'd be one of the most important people in 500 years ago. 500 years ago. But let's flash forward to now, and I yep. could be too. So, and I and I'm here too. Um, so, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I, I edit the clips. Yeah, Nikki, think about this. If if you were back in that time, yeah. you would be a great court jester. I know. Uh, no, no, I, I, I do not mind. I, I, and I if you Nick weren't funny, weapon. they would kill you. They probably yeah. would. Yeah, I'd probably just be funny all the time. 
<sighs> All right. Well, anyway, we just wanted to get you to ask us a question so we could say we were interviewed by you. So we accomplished that. True, Let's man. check that off our list. It's been The Rock, Margot Robbie, and the Meat Pop Express, brother. We did it. Yes, Ben. We did it. We did it. We did it. All right. So, Chris, thank down. you so much for your time. Really, um, it's an honor to have you on. Thanks for being so gracious with your time, with your sharing, with everything you do. And thanks for everything you're doing for pro wrestling, bringing real conversations, you know, where people can get them across, you know, all of media. So thank you so much for all of that in all seriousness. We really appreciate it. I making appreciate wrestling you guys. legitimate, wrestling media, making it legitimate. We love it. I appreciate you guys. And look, I think that no one in as a wrestling fan wants to hear, oh, there's another wrestling podcast out there. But then when you guys stepped into the game with the gimmick here, with making us all laugh, I feel like people went, yes, this is the podcast we have so all true. been waiting for. The Meat <laughs> Pop Express, baby. Whew, that's clip. a clip. That's, that's a, a clip. That's a hell of a clip. That's a, and that's, that's it. it. Chris, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chris Van Vliet. It was an absolute honor to have you here on The Express. I feel, pun yeah. intended, I feel like I've been filled with so much insight. Oh, inside. That's the that's the way to get to get the gimmick out there. No, we feel I I feel great. I feel energized. I'm just talking to that guy. He exudes positivity. He just exudes just perfection in this craft. He's done. He won't tell you that he has, but he sure has. He's, you saw the plaques, folks. You saw both of them behind it. You saw the, the silver play buttons and he's got two. He's got two of them. So I, I, I thought, I don't know. I'm on cloud nine right now. I'm almost speechless, Nick, after that. Yeah. Interview. It's like, the, man, met my hero. Um, I don't really know if, if we can go up from here. I think this is the highest. Mine, I think we're just going to close it down. I think that's it. Pretty that's much it. Go, go. <laughs> so go check out Chris everywhere. You know, he's got, he's got the, uh, he's got the podcast podcast. He's got insights with Chris Van Vliet. He's got it all. He's everywhere. And I'm going to tell you how to find him. You just open your phone and he's going to be right there. That, mm -hmm. that, that jawline is going to be right in your face. But anyway, Ben, you got anything else to say to these marks? Nothing else. Let's take it home. Keep it positive. Keep it trucking and keep the shades on. Cause the sun never sets on a cool guy later marks.